Hello. I hope we're live now. And we're now going on to the third question. COVID-19 uh, lockdown regulations. Necessary response or government overreach? And I want to invite Team Sisipo to, to join me on the stage uh, and begin with their presentation. I see Sonwabo has joined us. Uh, Jess has joined us. Uh, Sisipo has joined us. Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, Sisipo. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I don't think we'll wait for the others to join because our presenter has joined, which is Jess. Um, she is a tax analyst student, and uh, the Sonabo is doing disaster and risk management. The other team members are in the space of economic, also industrial um, policy, not for putting civil engineering as well. So I will hand over to our presenter then. Thank you. Thank you very much, and do go ahead, Jess. Good afternoon, my name is Jess and I hope everyone can hear me. So I'm going to begin our debate. South Africa currently stands in the top five of the highest case mortality ratio. This means for each 100 confirmed COVID case, 3% of people have died. The discussion at hand is an important reflective question faced by all leaders around the world. And for South Africa is no different. Are COVID regulations necessary or is the government overreaching? Necessary can be defined as, an in, as inescapable, required and compulsory per the Merriam-Webster de de definition. Viewing South African regulations through such a simple lens already reminds us without any action, South Africa would be doomed to failure. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but foresight is better, especially when it comes to saving life or some pain, in the wise words of William Blake. Our key emphasis today in this debate is to remind you that the hindsight allows critique, but when reflecting, it is important to consider the circumstances available, information, and social and economic environments South Africa found itself in as COVID struck, and be reminded that South Africa tried to execute regulations with foresight. We believe that South Africa's COVID regulations were necessary and we'll be proving this through the evaluation of some indirect and direct economic drivers, namely the constitution and its influences, reactions to fear, healthcare infrastructure, and the alcohol ban. The constitution of the Republic of South Africa gives the government the responsibility under section 27.2 to take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of each of its rights of its citizens. To this end, the South African government acted on this provision and the Disaster Management Act of 2002 to place the Republic on the lockdown as a non-pharmaceutical intervention to respond to the spread of the virus. The lockdown aimed at reducing the community transmission and to buy some time for the state put together to allow them to put together ph pharmaceutical means of fighting the pandemic such as procurement of oxygen, PPE, and vaccines. It would also buy time for the statistical and mathematical modelers and planners to understand the trajectory of the virus in order to provide the government command council with effective based recommendations for effective and efficient interventions. The lockdown positively affected health dimensions of well-being, since it substantially limited the spread of the virus. As seen in the graph, we can see the number of active cases fall during a lockdown and rise upon easing of restrictions. Lockdowns were necessary and acted as a driver to economic salvage in the sense that with the control, the government was able to ensure that the available resources were able to cater for a manageable number of effective people. Indirectly, by controlling the number of infections, the government was able to channel some response funds away from pharmaceutical response interventions toward welfare and livelihood sustaining interventions, 
such as the RDG grant. These interventions would ensure a quicker and easier post-COVID-19 recovery, thus overall proving that the influence of the constitution and federal demands were necessary for South Africans. The only advantage South Africa had was that COVID-19 was reported openly in Europe, and by the time it hit South Africa on the 5th of March 2020, some information had already been gathered about it. However, this information was not enough to put people at ease. Panic buying and hoarding of essential commodities meant a looming state of chaos. The government had to intervene and ensure order and a sense of normalcy prevailed during the emergency. Using provisions by the Constitution, the Public Health Act, the Disaster Management Act, amongst other pieces of legislation, they put together lockdown interventions. Early implementation of lockdown reduced the doubling time for transmission from two days to a doubling time of 15 days, thus delaying the first peak of COVID. The delay in implementing these lockdown regulations had dire consequences, and the UK is a classic example of how delayed lockdowns impact the health systems and the fiscus. This can be seen in the trajectory graph below which further emphasizes how policies are aided in avoiding the seemingly inevit inevitable, not only for South Africa, but countries around the world. A leadership vacuum during disasters have far reaching consequences. In economics, the concept of, of tragedy of commons usually comes into play when people are supposed to choose a stand that will serve the common good. If the tragedy of commons persisted, the South African government is justified per the constitution to correct that in externality. Since little was known about COVID, fear and anxiety were experienced by the population. And in order to avoid chaos and anarchy and ensure a systemic, efficient and efficient um, response, the government had to invoke lockdown restrictions. The significance of the lockdown was to prepare the health sector adequately for anticipated different waves of the virus. Furthermore, positive implication of this action was to ensure that the health sector was not overwhelmed when cases of the virus peaked. Another major positive impact of the lockdown on the healthcare sector is that it afforded the government more opportunities to raise funds from non-active sectors during the lockdown and channel those funds to the health sector. To best understand the potential of non to little regulations, India has been chosen as a comparison country, as, they, as South Africa and India both have emerging economies. The South African 2021 budget proposed a total consolidated spending of 248 billion on the health sector. This is half of the proposed health budget for India for 2021, which was 445 billion. However, the South African health budget, budget is far better proportionally when compared to India, considering the population of South Africa is a mere 60 million, while India is 1.3 billion. The measures of providing this massive funding and regulations, such as lockdowns by the South African government, was to protect the already, the already fragile health system from crumbling. Unlike India, the massive surge of COVID cases in 2021 was attributed to their lack of lockdown regulations, their government's unwillingness to draft policies and to protect the health sector and to enforce lockdown regulations, further indicating the power and the necessity of South Africa's regulations. Another COVID-19 policy by the South African government was the banning of alcohol sales. This was implemented to, ma to minimize alcohol-induced road accidents when indirectly reducing the critical road accident crisis burden on the health sector, thus leaving more space for hospital beds of COVID-19 patients. According to BBC, alcohol has the highest number of non-natural death rates in South Africa, with 14,000 annual deaths per annum on the road as a result of alcohol effects. Furthermore, most cases of domestic violence against women and children are induced by alcohol abuse. The government of South Africa envisioned that alcohol-induced domestic violence would be on the rise during the lockdown if adequate measures were not taken, such as the alcohol ban. This was effective as the cases of the alcohol-induced motor accidents, bike accidents, stabbings, and domestic violence against women and children because of alcohol abuse was reduced during lockdown. 
Although the much-discussed controversial policy were opposed by many, it has clear social and preventative positives and was a necessary implementation. To summarize our arguments, the South African government is bound by the constitution to implement policies to protect the nation. Panic, bound, panic buying and hoarding and even possible chaos was eliminated through the government establishing its leadership through policymaking. The already fragile healthcare system was protected and South Africa learned from its other countries with similar healthcare systems and economies. The South African government acted with foresight and channeled funding toward the healthcare sector through preventative policies. With South Africa's reputation of 14,000 deaths per annum and facing a gender-based violence pandemic, South Africa ensured hospital beds were freed up to provide space for the COVID-19 pandemic at hand. The common thread is clear. Preventative regulations were taken in the interests of South Africans with intentional foresight of reducing COVID-19 transmission. It can be seen that COVID-19 regulations were not only necessary, but were powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's team necessary. And uh, we we are about to reach to 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 reach out to team overreach, uh, and I hope they will be joining us. Thanks to Jess and Chigozi and uh, uh, Santos and Colisi. Uh, although maybe Santos is joining us for team overreach. Uh, let me check. So team overreach is team Cassandra, who is the, the, the leader, I think. Uh, but she has not joined us. So I, I, I don't know amongst those who are here, uh, Matthew, Nonkuleku, uh, I see Cassandra is there now. Do we have a presenter and slides? Afternoon, Prof. Afternoon, everyone. So we do have a presenter. We've actually got two presenters. We've got Matthew that will kick off the presentation, followed by Nonku, and Matthew will also be sharing his slides. So I'll hand over to Matthew. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Let's. Hello. Let me just quickly share my screen. Can you see the screen? Uh, we don't yet see your screen. We can see the presentation now. Okay. To start off our debate, I would like to first thank all the speakers and people that participated in this winter school. It has been most informative and we are greatly appreciative of all your help and your contributions. Now, to get into the debate, I would like to explain our position from a point of reference. Our point of reference is the lockdown restrictions and the, their measures were only logical in their reasoning, however, illogical in their application, as the government did not fully consider the demographics and the socioeconomic consequences of a hard lockdown in terms of the level four and level five lockdowns. This was mentioned in terms of the Constitution and the Disaster Management Act. To highlight this, I would first like to point out that in terms of the law, there's a distinct difference between a state of emergency and a state of disaster. The state of emergency derives its power from section 37 of the Constitution, which states that Government has the power to limit people's rights or derogate them in exceptional circumstances in the best interest of the people and the country as a whole. Whereas a state of disaster derives its power through the Disaster Management Act of 2002 and does not grant the government any power to derogate people's rights, but rather only limit them in exceptional circumstances, which COVID-19 does qualify as. The worrying point is that the level five rights or the level five lockdown limited people's rights and derogated them to a point that was illogical and inconsistent with the constitution. 
By this, I would like to highlight the fact of the infamous videos of the Cape Town housing removals, where in the Constitution it states in Chapter 2, the Bill of Rights, Section 26, that housing is a guaranteed right as enshrined by the Constitution, which in all South Africans' minds is the founding document of the democracy of South Africa that we know today. It is something which is hard fought and well won in terms of its power and its application. Another concerning fact is Section 27 of the Bill of Rights also states that health care is a constitutionally guaranteed right. This is especially concerning when you consider that 16% of South African citizens have access to medical aid and that 38% of the public health care institutions in South Africa, out of the 851 public health care institutions, only 38% of them qualify for quality standards of health care. This shows radical inequalities in the South African socioeconomic climate and highlights that government actually planned its response to the COVID-19 pandemic based on first world countries and their application of their restrictions and regulations. And it did not properly consider the plights and the fights that people within South Africa face, especially with regard to the informal economic sector and informal settlements in terms of housing. It is approximately 200,000 people, homeless people living in the streets of South Africa. And this is brought into question in terms of the government's application of social distancing, wearing masks, regular sanitizing and washing of hands. How are people without access to basic sanitation, water, or even homes in this case, meant to abide by these restrictions and during a level five lockdown, stay at a house which they do not possess? even though it has been promised to them by the constitution. This highlights the fact that the government did not properly think through and apply its mind to the problem at hand facing South Africans, but more used the carbon copy approach of first world countries and countries leading healthcare qualities and services in European and other areas. The criminalization of contravention of these healthcare and standards has led to many people actually radically questioning the government's application and their intentions. Another thing that has further questioned people is the ban on tobacco, as this was not founded in any medical science or anything that it contributed to furthering the demise of the COVID impact on the population. And it can be seen to be overreached through the government in terms of its will to control the population instead of trying to obey them in their plights. The Bill of Rights also says that all people within South Africa are guaranteed their rights in terms of the Disasters Management Act, insofar as it limits the access of other people to their rights, where we can see that the government used these limitations on rights to use carte blanche in terms of the police force and the army, in terms of their removals and their humiliation of some people who were in contravention of the standards of health care and the regulations. This has further led to another pandemic in our country, which is the regard of education. Education is another constitutionally enshrined right that was negated almost to a lesser extent due to the COVID-19 as the focus shifted from healthcare and to the vaccine. The vaccine was prioritized over education and people in informal settlements right to access to education as they could not access the quality enough technology and services to access education in the masses. When you consider also that there are 3.9 million people in South Africa who rely daily on public transportation, how in a realistic sense are all these people meant to socially distance to a degree that is acceptable by government while maintaining their level of income in terms of business. The closure of businesses for the level four and level five lockdowns further raise the question of mortality rates of COVID versus the poverty cycle that is very prevalent in our country being a third world developing economy. The question posed itself is if the mortality rate that is faced with COVID is that in contravention with the poverty cycle, which claims many more lives on a daily basis than COVID ever has or ever will. 
This led to the spread of economic stagnation throughout the economy, while the virus was only mitigated to a certain degree, as seen by the second and third waves. This had a great impact, though, on the social aspect of it. The social aspect was the increase in gender-based violence and child abuse. This was helped, in fact, by the alcohol ban, but not mitigated due to the level five lockdown, meaning that people stuck in cases with abusive partners were unable to leave their house as it was against the law and against public policy. Another pandemic is the public health sector of HIV testing and AIDS and the distribution of immunosuppressed drugs as this declined drastically due to the focus on the healthcare pandemic of COVID. Food insecurity, especially amongst children in informal settlements, was another issue which we did not fully consider in our application of the regulations. As many people went hungry or even died of starvation or lack of nutrition with regard to food insecurity rather than the COVID vaccine. The increase in mental health illnesses and the furthering completion of the poverty cycle led many people to become inconsistent with COVID regulations as they became exacerbated with the government's response and lack of government foresight. This is where my partner, Monkele, will come in with the economic impacts of the lockdown. Thank you, Matthew. I would, start like, I, would start, I would like to start by setting the scene and providing context uh, for, to justify why we believe that the lockdown restrictions for levels four and five exacerbated existing structural uh, and economic challenges in South Africa. So the pandemic and its related lockdown restrictions exaggerated, like I said, the existing structural challenges in the country. Um, and it's, um, excuse me. So uh, according to the National Treasury, the South African economy has experienced stagnant growth over the past decade, and the real GDP has over the past decade has averaged at 1.4%, which is way below the population the average population growth of 1.6%. And this was made worse in 2021, in in 2020. Um, secondly, according to Oxfam, South Africa continues to have some of the highest levels of income racial and gendered inequality. And some of the greatest challenges to the South African economy is the lack of adequate infrastructure that is related to telecommunications, uh, that is internet access, energy, electricity, and other various forms of public infrastructure, including healthcare. And we believe that this was not taken adequately into account when the lockdown restrictions or formulated or and secondly I'd like to move on to the second point which is to state that certain lockdown restrictions um, took the existing structural challenges for granted and did not align with the existing economic national economic objectives most regulations took a blanket approach to restricting economic activity instead of considering each sector per se. As a result, some industries which were initially categorized as non-essential, such as mining, construction, and some recreational activity, took a hard knock without a proper risk assessment. So some of the results that have come out of the uh, level four, four and five restrictions include an increase in unemployment. Uh, in the second quarter of 2020, um, it was shown that unemployment in, increased by 30.1%, uh, which translated into over 600,000 job losses, especially in the informal sector. Related to this is the point about the unequal access to network and data. Uh, and with traveling restrictions, some in the labor market were suddenly required to work remotely from their homes. Yet as we have seen, the, connect the connectivity and infrastructure 
was not able to entirely meet the demands for network and data services, leading to further job losses. Um, several businesses had to shut down over 2020 and recently. This is especially true for the informal sector, which was almost entirely de uh, destroyed over, especially in during lockdown level five, where many traders were unable to operate because they were required to stay at home, uh, while larger chain stores were allowed to operate. And as I said, this further exacerbated the, the unequal access to economic opportunity which is largely racialized in South Africa. The support for small and medium businesses proved also to be inadequate. And this is connected to the issue of corruption as some funds that were set aside to, for the support of the unemployed citizens and for the support of SMMEs were plundered by corrupt state officials. Uh, as a result of these lockdown restrictions, we've also seen a decline in public and private investment. Now to our closing point, we believe that lockdown restrictions were only logical in their reasoning and not in their application. Therefore, they had the unforeseen effect of worsening the levels of structural inequality in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much to Team Overreach. And uh, before we uh, conclude the session, uh, let me do it. Uh, let me, I think this one, I, I hope it's going to be uh, closer. So here's a poll. Government COVID regulations, necessary or overreach? Hmm. I was thinking this one was going to be more balanced. But it does look like uh, we have an audience, at least, who uh, believe in the necessity of, uh, of government lockdown regulations uh, or, or who have been convinced by the arguments made by the first group. Uh, although, I think compared to our other polls, uh, if we look at it now, it's a little bit more balanced. 65% say they were necessary and 35%, a solid minority, uh, say they were overreach. So allow me to close the poll, and then I have an announcement to make uh, that uh, we will now, we're now going to have a short break, and uh, the panelists are going to meet and decide who is the winning team. Uh, and and uh, after the break, we're going to have a prize giving and a closing ceremony, which I strongly uh, encourage you to attend. Uh, if you join the break session, you will be able to view some great graphic harvesting of the session. So you'll be able to see yourself in the session, some of the pictures uh, of you, and uh, you'll then be notified uh, when the closing and prize giving session uh, is live. So please join the break session, have it on there, and, and we will notify you when the next session comes on. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of the teams, and good luck to you in uh, being the winning team. Thank you.